Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Boz, and welcome to Sunday Night. It is uh, 6 o'clock Central Time, and we are live from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I just want to say welcome to everybody that's tuned in ahead of time. I have a great show for you tonight, and hope that you learn a little something about the ketogenic diet or nutrition in general. Uh, I've had a few uh, stories from the past week that inspired what I was going to talk about tonight, so I just want to say thank you for those of you that continue to share your stories. The folks that come to my local keto group uh, are very helpful for me to just practice educating people to see if what I'm thinking and what I'm trying to communicate actually gets received well enough that they understand it and can parrot it back saying, this is what I think you said. So I just wanna say thank you to all of those folks. I am uh, gonna start out like I do every week and that is trying to be as real as you and that is, we're gonna check numbers. Uh, I will use a ketone strip um, that is purple and when you set it in and check the uh, code that goes with the ketone strip, it should say uh, 297. Uh, and that's going to match what's my strips. And we're going to also just check glucose strips, which don't have a code. But um, I have had several of you write in saying, um, you know, asking about my numbers. In recent weeks, they've been very good. It's always a little unsettling to say that before I check them. But um, and wondering what I think the cause of such a great um, uh, metabolism boost has been. So this one's my ketone one, still counting down, takes a little longer to do than the glucose ones. But I really think the, um, yeah, 1.6, uh, and again, that's, that's a great number. Uh, you look back over time and um, I didn't always have this good of a metabolism. I've been working at this for a few years too. And uh, we're gonna check the, these numbers at the end of the show, but <clears throat> people have said, why do you think your metabolism is so strong in recent weeks? And if uh, you look back a couple years ago, my normal ketone numbers were 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Um, I still, I started fasting once a week, um, really because a few patients needed somebody to walk with them on a journey that they didn't think they could do. And I said, well, I'll do it with you. <laughs> And then I posted my numbers publicly, and then I've continued to do those uh, weekly fasts. Originally, I did eight of them, uh, and I did 72 hours. It wasn't the first time I fasted, but it was really the first time I fasted publicly. And then since then, I try to at least fast until my Dr. Boz ratio is 40 or less. Um, in recent weeks, I've been, um, so that was a couple of years ago, but outside of fasting, my ketone number was rarely above one. I mean, maybe 1.0, maybe 1.1. And the process of how it's grown over the years, I think has been, um, there's been times of a stall that it, I couldn't get it above 0.7 and I couldn't hardly get my Dr. Boz ratio to a, a, a number of 40 or less without fasting. And uh, I have continued to make a little bit better choices in my foods, continued to take out even more of the things that I still like, but probably don't do such a good job for my metabolism. But I really think the last few weeks, there's been just a very nice increase in my ketone production. And I think it's after I did that, my husband would call it a harebrained idea, <laughs> to do a, a sauna a Finnish sauna, which means there's these stones and you put water on them and you heat up with moist air uh, twice a day for a week. Uh, we started out the week thinking we could do it for an hour twice a day. By about the third day, we said, forget that. <laughs> if we can make it a half an hour, we're doing great. Um, and then by the end of the week, we were at like 24 minutes and done. Uh, but twice a day, so we really kind of challenged our metabolism, really stressed our mitochondria uh, during that week of, of uh, using Asana. And I really think that's why my ketones have just been really good ever since. Um, on my Instagram, I was really good that week about posting <laughs> the, the sauna journey, uh, but I really haven't posted much. I, we are trying to do the sauna once a day. Our goal is to reach seven times in a week. And... You know, if you set it once a day, that's great. And if there's times when life and kids don't let you do it once a day, then we bounce out of that habit and try to get in two in a day. Eh, 
Uh, if you look at this, the, the show a few weeks ago, we talked about um, if you could reach between four and seven uh, times in the sauna, how all-cause mortal mortality was dramatically increased. That's a great study to look at, um, but that's what inspired us to start this, and I think that's the reason for my numbers. All right, so tonight I try each week um, to start my fast somewhere in Sunday. Sometimes I do it start on Saturday, but um, we had all three of our sons home uh, this weekend, and so we did our traditional board game on Sundays, and we have a little food around the board game. So we did that over lunch hour, so I, I think I finished eating around 11.30 or so and have been fasting since, so that's about six hours of fasting. But for 1.6 ketones, uh, that's pretty good at six hours fasting for me. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is I am going to uh, take a um, take uh, MCT C8, C10 uh, soft gels. Usually I take BHB uh, or exogenous ketones and then I check them at the end of the hour, but this, um, this time I'm going to take a handful of my MCT C8, C10. And I talked to people that this is a little different way to increase your production of ketones. I don't, I'm actually kind of nervous about taking these because I'll be up late. <laughs> it's a lot of energy. Uh, but in the spirit of showing you what happens when you take uh, supplements, you, those exogenous ketones are going to be in your circulation within minutes. Uh, we're gonna see what my ketones do in an hour, or about an hour now that I've been talking for about six minutes, um, of exogenous of MCT C8, C10. So <clears throat> give me just a second. Hmm. Okay, so that is um, six, six of the MCT soft gels. Again, C8, C10 is the oil. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about that in our journey. So I'll wait to talk about that in a minute. All right, so I, <clears throat> I have um, a story from the past week that has, uh, I had a different plan for this Sunday, but decided to change my plan and talk about what happens when you've been keto for a long time and somebody says, how do you start this thing? And they're like, kind of interested, <laughs> okay? I mean, there's some fanatics out there and they are really interested and they would sit and listen for hours on how can you calculate this and plan this. And um, they're the kind of people who've watched the online course and just marched right into a healthier journey of their life. And you're like, congratulations, you win. That is amazing, but that's not everybody. Uh, so specifically this past week, uh, I had a, a, one of my local ketone uh, um, support group people, uh, I heard her son wanted to be keto. And her son happens to go to school where my sons go to school. And there was actually a bet <laughs> that he couldn't be keto for a week. And he's a weightlifter, he's in uh, weightlifting and really thought uh, <laughs> that, um, this would be easy, so he tried it a couple of times, maybe in the last week, and saw his mom was doing it, so he thought this would be easy. Didn't kind of like how that felt the first day or so, and then backed away a little bit, but leave it to teenage boys. Somebody bet him that he couldn't do it. And of course, I said, let's help him. Let me show you how to do this. And so she's like, oh my gosh, come help me. I don't, uh, you know, I'm the mom. They don't listen when you're the mom. And boy, I know all about that. So if I look at, um, some of the things that I did to help him, um, his mom checks her blood numbers, and so uh, I did bring that up a little bit, but we're gonna talk about what's the best way to show somebody the quick and easy way to go keto uh, for that person that's just, just kind of interested. And so let's take a look. All right, so we're gonna start by showing you one of the, um, one of the tools, one of the resources that I created probably, I mean, I created this before I ever wrote the book any way you can. Um, it, it looks a little better now than the first version I did, <clears throat> but it really was um, most people doing the ketogenic diet as they step into it, their brains are kind of foggy, especially in my internal medicine clinic. If I handed them a, you know, an inch thick book and said, go read the book, even if it was an interesting story and compelling, most of them didn't do it. Um, uh, even if I sent them to a playlist on YouTube, they're like, nah, they would get distracted. They'd never get to the bottom of the playlist. Uh, I sent them an audio book. <laughs> they're like, 
ah, I just don't do audiobooks. I mean, what I'm trying to show you is their concentration and their desire to improve their health. They didn't understand what they what they didn't understand. They were really saying, ah, you know, she talks about this thing, less carbs, uh, you know, I guess that's less white food. And that's about all the further they look. And then they kind of go on and say, oh, I tried that keto thing. It didn't work. I did it for like a day. And so this was a perfect audience for me to be reminded, what does it look like when somebody's brand new? They don't have, I mean, this, this teenage boy's mom had gone keto, but she's kind of like, you say that word and people get a little weird. So I just kind of kept it to myself. So I said, well, let me go talk to him. So I show up at their house. Um, I think it was after the show last week that I said, just let me come over and do some teaching. And I'll show you what I started with. So let me click over to here. So I started with uh, the food guide. Uh, and if you haven't seen the food guide, it is one of the few things where um, I'm big on just don't use so many words, use pictures, use animation, be sure to have um, the capture of your audience that you can teach them without overwhelming them. And so this food guide is the basics. It is like meant to be short bullet points, not even complete sentences. This is pictures and lists of food. Oh, doc, okay, you say count carbs. I don't know how to count carbs. I've never done that before. So that gets them off in a sidetrack and then they stop doing it. So I said, I, I hand them this book and say, all right, start with the good choices, move to better when you get good, good mastered, and then we'll get to best somewhere in the next year. So I thought I'd review what's in this food guide to say, if you're just looking for the punchline, you're trying not to overwhelm either your spouse or your office mate or somebody who said, gee, why you look great. How, how are you doing that? Um, uh, this is what I would hand them and say, look, this is what I started out with. Um, take my food guide and use it. And I will tell you a little bit more about that in a second. So here we go. Food guide, um, eating. Uh, this is our hero. <laughs> he is hero fat. Uh, and I, I like to point out that um, we start it, I mean, whenever I'm trying to change somebody's behavior, um, we don't start out and say, oh, you know what? Here's the perfect uh, dance. We start with improved options. Then we get to a little bit better. And then we finally master that skill. And I really use that when I'm teaching people about how do you go to a ketogenic diet? Um, so if they've been keto a while and they're like, you know, doc, I want your, my numbers to look like yours on the show. How do you do that? Um, Here's a great example for those of you watching, which are probably not newbies. I mean, there might be some new people out there, but boy, um, when I say, if you really want to get your numbers to look higher on a, um, on a blood meter or on a urine ketone strip, exogenous ketones will do that. And you'll see a lot of bickering out there about, oh, that's cheating. You can't do that. And um, it's not what I want you to do forever, but if they're beginning or if they're struggling with several other, you could call them pre-existing conditions in 2020, and everybody probably knows what that means this year. Um, but the exogenous ketones have more than just this keto fuel, which will give them energy. They have, um, a, they are a signaling agent. And that might sound like a lot of, a word that you don't have, a, uh, but it goes into the body and it talks to other cells. The presence of ketones does more than just give you f fuel in the, in the ketone lane as opposed to just the glucose lane. Exogenous ketones deliver um, a suppression of glucose. They, they lower your blood sugar. Uh, they actually suppress your appetite. Uh, they talk to your, the way your DNA winds up. Uh, there's a whole host of things that they do deep within your cells. Um, and you'll see many people say, I, you know, I was really struggling to get through my fast. I, I, I couldn't seem to do it. And I'll tell them, just swallow a few ketones during your fast. And they're like, doesn't that break my fast? And I'm like, it's better than eating uh, if you're trying to make your fast. And what happens is those few ketones get in their circulation. And then they had really good energy and they suppressed their appetite and they made it to the next day, which sometimes is their first 36 hour fast. And I said, all right, now just don't extend your fast past 36 hours. Keep doing it once a week. And each week, try to take in less of those ketones. And once you can do it without ketones, then we can talk about the next level. 
All right, so exogenous ketones are one way to, to increase the ketones on your, on your glucose uh, or on your um, blood measuring unit. But I took uh, exogenous ketones, excuse me, I took medium chain triglycerides, MCT, specifically the chain length, the length of the fat of eight carbons long or 10 carbons long. And that's a little scientific for some people, but it really is important that once you uh, study why those are important, they do not need, they are fats that do not need to be digested. They are simply absorbed, uh, go right through the portal vein into your liver. And the liver's only response for those um, C8, C10 fats is to turn them into ketones. So I call them fresh made ketones. Like if you're saying you don't want exogenous ketones, you don't want them made outside your body, you want your own system to make them. C8, C10 probably delivers the most efficient way to raise ketones. Um, again, it's not forever. We, we eventually want you making ketones out of your stored fat, but that means that the chemistry inside your system needs to get stable. You have to be a little more efficient or practiced at uh, using ketones and making them, and that's not gonna happen in the first 24 hours. All right, and then there's fasting, of course, and we've done lots of shows on fasting. Okay, so that's just one way of, me, of, of the format of this uh, little booklet is good, better, best. Uh, we just did good, better, best for how do you make ketones? So let's go to the next one. Um, this just reminds you that that's not your enemy. <laughs> that is your friend. And that can be really hard for people when they first start. Uh, I, I really work at saying, all right, that first week is very overwhelming. Do not, do not turn on a calorie counter. Do not turn on a fat counter. I love it if you are, if, if you're driven enough to count carbohydrates, and if you do use a little tool to count carbohydrates, 20 or less is the rule. So that is um, another like easy way to do this. Um, we talk about, is it working? You can check um, the blood ketones, like I check them, but I wouldn't have this teenage kid do that. His mom has a meter and can check his finger. And she did say that I practically chased him around the kitchen table because he, every time he felt we could poke his finger, he would be like, oh. And I've, I've done that exact same dance with my teenage boys. So. I will tell you that I'd have them use a urine ketone stri strip test. All you're looking for is did you arrive at ketosis and you cannot get any of those ketones in your urine until you have um, had them in your circulation. Like that's not an accident. They don't kind of end up in your urine. Either you have them in your urine or you don't. And that's because they were first in your circulation. So I told this kid, he probably doesn't even need to do that. He could. Um, but what I was really focused on with this new newbie was, I want you to open up this, uh, this book and tell me, uh, we went to this page at first and said, all right, tell me on this page, what would you eat? And so he, I said, start it good, because sometimes those are the foods that um, they don't have as much fat or they have some other things that aren't quite as ideal. Um, but they're, they're, they're easy on the palate. So I said, start it good, tell me what you would eat, and then work your way up to better or best. And this kid <laughs> starts reading this, we turn to this page and he's like, pepperoni? That's on the list? I'm like, yep, pepperoni. He goes, ah, oh, tomorrow they're gonna serve pizza at school. And I said, here's the way you eat pizza on the ketogenic diet. You take the toppings off, which is cheese, and pepperoni, and maybe they had a few mushrooms on that one, I don't know, uh, but at least cheese and pepperoni. And instead of having, you know, he's a big boy, instead of having three slices of pizza, maybe it's gonna take five in order for you to feel full, just don't eat the crust, just scrape the top off and eat those top uh, toppings. And he was kind of surprised, like, really? That's like, that's the best part. <laughs> so he started there, but what happened next was what made me laugh so hard. Uh, and that is that his mom was looking at the list too, and um, where did my where did my can go? Mm. Oh, here it is. Uh, his mom was looking at the list and said, "Oh, you can you cannot be serious. Uh, how how is uh, let's see here? I'm trying to find the right one. Here we go." Mm. Oh, I did, I know I did wrong. Uh, so I pushed the wrong button. 
she said, how is spam on the list? And so I, I have a can of spam here that I want uh, you to see. Uh, my husband bought this. It has 25% less sodium on it, which wouldn't matter on the ketogenic diet. Um, but uh, spam made the list. And she's like, spam? Spam made the list? And I said, look at the ingredients. Uh, she says, isn't that like super processed? And she's like, you know, we have some friends who actually, uh, they, um, they eat luau loaf. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's just a fancy way to say spam. They took pork and they especially took the parts of pork that aren't quite organ meat, but they aren't the prettiest parts of the pig. <laughs> and they put them in a loaf and they put some salt on it. Now, this version has some carbs in it. It's got, a, you know, some little potato starch and a, a hint of sugar. But I'll tell you, um, when you look at the amount of ingredients on it, let me just show you this um, here. When you look at how many carbs that has on it, you say, yeah, total carbs is one. So uh, in the world of options, spam is not bad. I'll be honest, the first time I ever, I grew up on a hog farm uh, and we might've had luau loaf, but we didn't call it that. <laughs> the first time I ever had spam, I was on a mission trip and canned meat was what was in the grocery store. And these amazing Haitians fried up some of the, so we were, we were tired, we were hot, we were sweaty. And some of these Haitians fried up some of the best smelling meat. I'm like, what is that? And of course it comes to you on a plate and you don't ask questions about what it is because you're so hungry. And afterwards uh, I said, what, it, how do you make that? What is that? And he said the word spam and I'm thinking, okay, there's, there must be something wrong with the translation here. You, you did what? And then he shows me the can and I'm like, that's spam? <laughs> it, was, it was delicious. I was so hungry. I was so thirsty. The salt tasted amazing. This was way before I was, uh, this was like, you know, almost eight years ago now. And I'm like, ever since then, there's always been spam in my cupboard. <laughs> Uh, but looking at spam, he said, okay, I would eat that. And his mom is just looking at me like, you are gonna, you're killing me. My husband has been a spam lover since we got married. We're 20 years into this game and I've been telling him how terrible that is for him. I'm like, I'm not on keto. Now don't put it on a cracker and don't have it with toast, but it, it's a great option for the ketogenic diet. All right, so let's keep going here. Um, uh, See, there we go. This one here. Uh, maybe. No, hold on. <laughs> this is what I was looking for. Thank you. All right. So if we look at, uh, back, go back to our food guide and say, what, what else is on there? Of course, um, I can't get through a lecture without mentioning Braunschweiger. And I'm from South Dakota. I often tease people that if you want to know uh, what your culture of food looks like, uh, go to your local gas station and see what's sold. So in some parts of the world, you go to local gas stations and they have different foods I've never heard of. I only learned this while on a mission trip, like such as spam. Uh, but if you go to the food uh, stores in South Dakota that are kind of like that the country mart where it's got a lot of things and it's the gas station, um, you'll find Braunschweiger or liverwurst in a yellow roll in the gas station. And I, uh, I can't help but say, well, why, why would I bring that up? So <clears throat> going to um, here and um, we're going to take away this single here. All right. So here is here are some of the vitamins where if you did look inside the book any way you can, there's this chart that says, here are these foods that have different kinds of nutrients in them. And I always talk about eat eating liver and sardines. Now, when you look at this chart, the, the red circles are around the, the vitamin with the highest number on this chart. So if you just look along <laughs> the liver um, uh, row there, uh, and, and by liver, I actually do mean liverwurst. Hold on here just a second. Um, and if I click here, if I click here, um, I don't know if I can get it to do that. Hold on. Don't give up on here. No, that's not going to work. All right. So you can see where liverwurst is. It's the second row from the bottom. In that row, though, um, it wins. Like, 
over and over and over again for the, for the different kinds of nutrients. Now look right above that in sardines, and you can see <clears throat> sardines has 8.9 in the red text. That means it was number two. And if I thought that was relevant, I tried to put it in red text for you. Uh, vitamin E and then choline, uniquely enough, is sardines. Just We're going to get to eggs in a minute. Notice eggs wins for choline uh, and folate, and uh, number two for folate and number two for um, B5. So you, you hop over to um, the minerals, which again, uh, especially looking at sardines, it gets number two for calcium, number two for iron, liver is the one who wins for iron. And then the other minerals, I mean, several of them, the sardines went out on. And you can't get out of the, <laughs> the first few videos when I'm talking about what types of foods do I really ask people to take away their biases, because I don't think the marketing team for liverwurst or sardines did a very good job of what nutrients you get out of this, um, and, and be willing to try it. So when I look at liverwurst, this is from my local meat store. Uh, here in Sioux Falls, we have an awesome meat store. We have Lux Meat Store, and uh, I don't have any endorsements for them, or I just love how well they supply their Braunschweiger. So I'm going to bring this into a little bit more focus and say, yeah, it is uh, liver sausage. Uh, that's German for uh, liverwurst, Braunschweiger. And then I like you to see uh, the ingredients, which is like, Four words. It is pork. It is uh, it is pork liver. It is pork sauce, uh, pork salt, and then some spices, onions and spices. I mean, I think that's amazing. If you if you were watching in the last couple of weeks, we went through some different fats and we talked about not having trans fats in your ingredients, and that total fat gets up there at 17 grams, and that's for like, I mean, the serving sizes on this was. Yeah, there's four serving sizes, so to eat the whole thing, which may sound ridiculous to many of you, but is not hard to do if you like it. I like it. Um, I grew up on this, and so I tell moms, it's your job to expand the palate of uh, what your kids will eat, and that means they have to taste it. So when your grandmother, especially in South Dakota, says, hey, eating this stuff isn't a bad idea, I'm telling you, it's actually filled with cholesterol and the kinds of fats that are... Um, are not easily oxidized. They do not. Um, they do not uh, bring on oxidant-free radicals into their fats. They're very stable, uh, and that is really one of the biggest predictors for whether or not it's going to what it's going to do inside your system. So there's Braunschweiger. Um, but for those of you that have been watching me on Facebook, um, the other thing I want to point out is this is another way to get beef liver. Um, and again, I don't have any endorsements. I just was looking for ways that you could get liver. I'm going to hold this up there and say, look at the number of uh, uh, ingredients that are found in that. Uh... So again, your saturated fats, zero trans fats, your carbohydrates you have a little bit of, but nothing exciting. And then you look through those vitamins and you're like, yeah. And what did they put in it? They put grass-fed beef and some sea salt and they dehydrated it. So I'm just going to take a taste here live. I, I've had a few bites before, and I find it fascinating. Uh, again, getting people to eat liver is like, I don't know, it's almost as offensive as saying the word keto <laughs> to some audiences. Um, but I look at uh, the, the liver, it's, it is like a chip. So if you're looking for something to dip a uh, high fat, uh, it tastes like liver. I mean, it's actually really crunchy. You, you get a taste of liver, but really not till the final third or fourth chew. And so, hmm, I like it. Um, so there's another another option for how do you get liver inside your your palate. All right, and then finally, um, on that same, um, actually not on that one. Let's go to our. Um, <laughs> So let's go back to our food guide really quick. Um, go over here, and we are going to scroll up to, um, I mean, it's easy to look at some of the pictures that are in this food guide and say, yeah, 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 ribs, um, perfect, some marbled steak. And those are, of course, what people first think about with the ketogenic diet, so I don't think they need much advertisement. But when you get to some poultry and eggs, I, I really point out that, um, again, good. You'll get people who use chicken breasts and slices of chicken. Well, this kid said, pheasant? 
Now we're from South Dakota, which is like the Mecca for hunting pheasants. And if you're like me, you're like, <laughs> like I'll eat liver, but pheasant, mm. And every person in South Dakota says, you just haven't tasted my pheasant. And I'm like, and I don't want to. <laughs> but pheasant and duck are actually very fatty birds. Um, but some more popular ones, the kid, you know, he, he said, there's pheasant on here and he likes it. So his mother must have a trick or something. Uh, but Buffalo Wild Wings are the other place where I tell patients, just if you like that, eat that. Eat that until you're sick of it. Dip it in some really heavy fat dressing, not the low fat ranch dressing. I want the blue cheese made out of real blue cheese. Um, those types of, um, of tastes will keep them on the ketogenic diet, but uh, don't have it with soda pop or beer. Uh, you're you're going to see alcohol here in a second. So, and they scroll down and this is just a picture of that's in the, the opposing um, uh, phase to that one. But what I really want you to see is what's under the, the fish, the shellfish, uh, fish and shellfish. So you go to good and honestly, cod, I suppose this, we're from the Midwest. So you're probably not going to find even he, he, oysters did not pull his attention in. Um, but he'd actually heard of sardines, not, with a lovely face or anything. Um, but I I think it's worth just showing you. Uh, okay, so here here is mackerel. Um, mackerel, again, easy, cheap, safe. This is in olive oil. It's great if you can find it in actual fish oil, but we can't. So olive oil is what we buy here. And um, I like to point out the ingredients in this one. Just check that out. It is, yeah, fish and some oil and some salt. So again, the fats that are in it, pretty low. And I just think that's amazing. Like it, it's a very easy food. The nutrients is dense. Um, this is where I push people to say, guess what? Um, if you haven't eaten um, mackerel or um, the, let me quickly go here. If you haven't eaten mackerel or you haven't eaten sardines, uh, this is our chronometer app. And I've done this a couple of times, just showing you how I would look up food. So if you go to foods and then you type in mackerel, I already did this ahead of the show. And in uh, this case, um, I would, um, let's just see if I can blow that up a little for you there. Yeah, it's, uh, I would, the, the serving size for this is, uh, yeah, 85 grams was what was on the can. And then you look at that, um, guess what? There are no carbs, there's no fiber, there's no sugar. Uh, and you get to the fats and there's like a lot of good fats. Um, you've got your monounsaturated fats, which is probably what the olive oil is from. And then you've got your fish, your omega-3, a little bit of omega-6, and that's the kind of omega-6 that's probably really stable, meaning it's not easy to turn into an oxidative stress. Um, and then trans fats are zero. Um, but almost more importantly, check out the minerals that are found in that can of sardines and the zinc. Uh, I think there's some vitamins up here. Yeah. The vitamins, again, people say, how do you get all your vitamins on a ketogenic diet? And I hand them that little book and say, what will you eat? And that's where we start. So let's go back to uh, here and there we go. All right, so we're gonna keep going through our little book here really quick because there's a couple other things I like to point out. So um, one of the challenges that I do in the uh, online course is that I tell people they have daily challenges for like the weeks two and three, trying to get them to like get out of what they don't know that they're locked in a shell of thinking. I'm trying to kind of push out of that habit into a, a place of other ideas. And I tell them to taste sardines. Just taste it and post on the Little Neurons Facebook page one bite of taking the sardines and then truly don't, don't, don't have a preconceived condition or uh, uh, set mindset that it's going to taste terrible. Uh, and I'm amazed at people saying, oh, it's really not that bad. It's not that bad. Now, liver is a different teachable food. This is just the pictures that go along with that previous uh, data. So for the vegetables, people say, well, what can I have for vegetables? So I have them turn to this page and I, I make sure that they read the statement that I put on the bottom, which is vegetables on a ketogenic diet are really meant to carry fat to your gut. I mean, again, we're trying to get you, we're trying to get a chemistry set going. We want ketones in circulation. That means that the food that goes in needs to ignite or trigger a chemistry set that can only be present when you have 
100% fat. So if you put in these lovely little salads with a sprinkle of uh, olive oil, that's not gonna cut it. We want foods that are going to carry the fat to your gut. Um, now rhubarb is about, and blackberries were about as fruity as I got. Uh, yeah, tomatoes are a fruit, I know. Um, but then kind of looking at some of the better options, uh, I love that Brussels sprouts, if you've not ever liked them before, and bacon grease, you can't find a better recipe than just taking your leftover bacon fat, slathering your, uh, your Brussels sprouts and, uh, that are cut in half, because you want to cut them in half so that the fat can get in between the little leaves of the Brussels sprout and make it even fattier. So, and then you put them under the broiler until they turn brown and even a little like dark brown and they have this kind of nutty fat bacon, mm, really good. Um, but then on the top, what I, what, I, what I tried to point out without really offending or kind of pushing people away too far was the fermentation of vegetables really helps on the ketogenic diet. So um, I just put cabbage in here, but fermented vegetables, that process where a bacteria really helps you uh, digest that that vegetable before you digest it, which sounds a little gross, but that's what that's what fermentation is. Um, those really do help. I, I think of the other major dishes that I use on the ketogenic diet is creamed spinach, like with sour cream and um, high fat cream cheese and some butter and garlic, and it's like the best. <laughs> I love it. But creamed spinach, and once you make it, you can use it in leftovers for a few days, and that that's how my life works. Um, so I, I then get down to dairy. Uh, I, I quizzed him saying, which, which of these, um, these milk products do you think is the best one for the ketogenic diet? And it's, it is amazing how much, when they learn stuff at school, uh, it does carry forward to how they sort uh, the answers for nutrition. And they're like, well, skim milk is what we use at school. And I said, so which of these do you think has the most carbohydrates in it? And I said, Cream, whole milk, or skim milk? And I think, he, I think he answered whole milk. And I explained, well, let's just talk about that. You take the milk out of a cow, and it's the part that floats to the top is the fat, and that's your cream. And when it's filled with fat, there's no, supposed to be, no place left for the sugar. Now, if they filter it perfectly, and with they do check those things, uh, then you have high density fat, and it should be zero to no carbs. And as you remove the fat, which skim milk has no fat in it, um, you'll then have lots of leftover place for that lactose, which is a sugar, which is a carb. So the highest carbs are in skim milk. And you know, using high fat milks to make cheeses, uh, I like the, 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 the rule that the harder the cheese, the better it is for the ketogenic diet. High fats make a harder cheese. So um, some of the little traps I've seen folks fall into is when they buy pre-shredded cheese. Uh, there's some powder that goes on those shredded cheese so it doesn't clump, which is great for the freezer and for marketing. But some of those powders are a form of a carbohydrate powder. And that's a lot of it in there once you take a bag of shredded cheese and say, I, I don't know what's wrong, Doc. I don't know where I'm getting carbs. And it's a little bitty thing, so it's not a big deal. but. All right, so there's the high fat. Um, we then go through the fats again, and this brings me back to just why did I swallow MCT, C8, C10 at the beginning of this. Um, I do point out that um, what is on the fats, uh, good, better, best, uh, is I actually don't like that, that sesame seed and grapeseed oil even made the list, um, but I'm trying to start with places where you migrate away from just pure vegetable oils or seed oils at all. I, I don't want them on the list. I learned if I take them completely off at the beginning, I get a lot of pushback. So I said, well, let's just start with a couple of seed oils, which still aren't great, but um, the closer we can get to fats that are solid at room temperature, uh, the better we can be. So as I look at um, fats like um, lard or tallow or um, butter, all of those are a better place for fats. Um, and again, we're, we, we looked for space on this uh, page and just said, you know what, we've mentioned the, the high fats from beef and the high fats from, uh, from the hogs in the other, <laughs> in the other uh, pages. So we said, well, let's make sure we do um, educate that these, these fats that are solid at room temperature really are the least likely to become 
uh, acidic and least likely to cause any of uh, the almost the rancidness that happens to oils over time. Also, we, we know that seed oils, uh, if you don't know this, the seed oils are not, uh, even olive oil is a seed, it's actually a fruit oil, um, but olive oil is great if you're not heating it. As soon as you start to heat it, that's when it becomes this chemistry that you shouldn't probably be putting in your human body. So looking at um, some of the stories that I, I try to tell along the way to my local groups, uh, if, you, if you talk to industry where they do frying of food, now whether that's a mom and pop place where they fry foods <clears throat> or it's a, uh, excuse me, Um, or it's, you know, a fast food restaurant. When you talk to the people who have, uh, I mean, nobody uses the good fats, I mean, I mean, the saturated fats, the lard, the tallow to fry their foods in, despite the unbelievably improvement in the taste, uh, they use the cheap oils, which are vegetable oils, lots of soybean oil, lots of even peanut oil, um, and watching to see that those fats at the first, um, intake of those fats, they, they say, oh, yep, we fry it up and we did great. But as those companies use these seed oil fats in their, in their vats and in their um, pipes, uh, they were astonished at how much grime ended up on the insides of their pipes and on, in, in their fryers. So you look at the evidence or just one of the, like, a story that is really easy to validate is talk to somebody who runs a restaurant saying, what oils do you use? to fry in and how do you clean your your fryer and you're like yeah every whatever the time is they have to clean it which is based on the oil in the fryer uh, they they will say it's a it's a huge process and the chemistry to remove this seed oil from the insides of their vat I mean it is a polymer uh, it, it is a it is a chemistry that's very sticky and heavy and I'm just telling you that's oxidized fat that they're talking about. That's what they did to it. They took the, the double bonds in the chemistry and the oxygen went to it, and it, especially in the heat, it, it becomes a glue. Uh, it is not meant to be in our human bodies either, and the less of that we have, the better my patients feel. Uh, so we can, that, that could be a whole lecture in and of itself. Let's keep going. We're almost done with our little book. Um, right here. Okay. Uh, so there's our lard, <laughs> um, oopsie daisy, and we're getting down to just some of the nuts. I always point out peely nuts, which I think are interesting. Peely nuts are really high in fat and they totally taste like butter. Um, I've, I've only actually seen them in a few places that are um, like uh, the industry, um, like food shows, uh, like ketogenic food shows. Uh, Peely, uh, actually, they come from the Philippines. Uh, that's where they're, they're naturally from. And you can have an allergic reaction to them, so just be careful. But, oh, they taste like butter. So great nut, very high fat. Again, macadamia nuts is a, is a good, good answer there. But when this kid saw that there were nuts available on the, on the diet, that's, was, that, that's where he said, oh, I could do that. Oh, I could do that. And, again, what he's doing is getting away from some of those other snacks that, um, like, when people say, ah, I'm just really struggling with potato chips or with, um, with uh, crackers. Um, and yes, the carbohydrates are the enemy as far as the ketogenic diet goes, but I would also show them that the answer for uh, feeling better is just, they're almost all fried in seed oils. And it is really hard on your brain and your body when you do that. So if there's one reason to find a different snack to snack on, uh, that's what, that's what I would recommend. Here's a, here's one of the examples that I found is a, it's a cheese that's again, um, used to, to be a snack and it's crunchy and it's salty, but I love the ingredients. Um, where is it at? Here we go. Yeah. So, uh, let's see here. Here we go. Yeah. It's a cheese <laughs> and salt and a few little like a little extra color. So again, the, the highest ingredients in a product is the first ones. The, the last ingredient is the lowest ones. That's uh, one of the rules for a label. And this is a great way to say it's not seed 
oils that you're swallowing. Uh, it really is just dairy cheese, and I know some people have troubles with dairy, but there are lots of other options out there to get away from um, even uh, the, the, the get the salt, get the crunch, get the snack part of things at the beginning of the ketogenic diet. And, and really that it does start with what are the options? And so showing them which nuts fit, um, that's what a peely nut looks like. You definitely wanna get that the skin off of the outside though. That's where the allergic reactions come from is their skin, so yeah. Um, anyway, uh, other things, when we look at what, what drinks are best, again, a fermented drink like kombucha, very good. Um, Carbohydrate free. <laughs> so when you look at uh, the way I, I tried saying that, I was okay, no cola, or um, you know, you could find about a million ways to try. Oh, but then it's orange juice. So I just said, okay, you're gonna have to look for carbs on the label for drinks because they're tricky. They really are. Um, even coconut and almond milk have plenty of carbs in them. But if you're looking for substitutes, that's another place to go. Um, better is coffee or some tea. And then uh, finally, um, you're, you know, and, and this better was when you, they add cream with it, they add some fat with it. Um, but if you get to the best one, it's where the coffee and the tea are black uh, and the mineral water and obviously has nothing else in it, just some, some minerals, yeah. Um, in the bigger picture, uh, when you're following that uh, keto continuum, when you're really going through the online course, when I have people who jump to best on the drinks and really skip that high fat section, I get a lot of comments and failure notices. This isn't working, I can't get my ketones up. And really they have skipped over several of the processes that we spend a good deal of time saying, here's where many people fail on the ketogenic diet is they do not get the chemistry right before they try to move up to that best level. So when I had this uh, teenage boy say, what would you drink on here? Um, you know, I think he ended up with bubble water. I don't, I mean, I don't, <laughs> it was not, actually, I think he said, well, my mom gave me one of your BHB drinks. I would drink that. And I said, okay, that's, that's a good place to start because it does have a sweetness to it. Um, and that helps for his uh, addressing of what, you know, what he could drink. Um, all right, so let's go to the sweets. And of course, the best one is none. Uh, again, addiction is real. Uh, using other ways to help satisfy your, sweet, uh, your sweets. Um, when this was made, I'll tell you that uh, the um, allulose was not very common. At least I heard of it in the science, but I really hadn't found it in the stores. So today I would change that those, those substitute sugars that... Um, allulose might get my number one, actually. Uh, the science behind allulose is amazing. I do a good, good uh, deep dive of this in my book that's coming out. Uh, and stevia, monk fruit would still make it, erythritol um, for gum or for mouthwash. <laughs> I'd probably still use it, but I probably wouldn't use that anymore. Um, but again, it's on the good list, so you're starting with improvements. Um, using other tricks to get a sweetness in your mouth to awake, which is cinnamon or a dark chocolate. And then of course, um, the less sugar substitutions, the less sweetness you have, the less sweetness you crave. Uh, that's really hard to convince somebody on the first week of keto. So I, I just said, there's ways that, I, I mean, I told him he could have some BHB, which has some sweetness in the, in the world of um, a ketogenic journey. All right, so again, alcohol always comes up. Uh, what can I have, doc? And again, alcohol does stop ketone production. So the best is, of course, none. But if you look, if you get some red wine, especially there are companies out there uh, that really promote uh, testing how much sugar content is in each wine. Dry Farm Wines is one of those. And again, I'm not sponsored by them, but really do find I don't have any affiliation with them is what I mean. Um, but they have been great at really leading the pack of evidence saying, what does each wine uh, correlate to as far as a, a carb level? Um, again, uh, distilled liquors are the ones that do have no carbs in them. Um, but most of the time I am gonna push you towards no alcohol. Not only is it really good for your brain, uh, obviously, this 17-year-old kid shouldn't have alcohol. His brain is very quickly developing, um, and it would stop that development by drinking alcohol. Uh, so looking at his, uh, his, he skipped this page, thank goodness. Um, and then I think I just went through some of the other ways. Why isn't it working? 
um, and went through, you know, what are some of the common mistakes people make for the, on the ketogenic diet. So what I hope you saw there was um, a couple of things that I had an idea about when I first started teaching this, and it's come really to fruition about the ways that a ketogenic diet can be used. Uh, number one, this little book is, um, it is made out of a non-terrible and waterproof uh, material because kind of like a, um, a old one-room schoolhouse where you passed on the actual physical textbooks to the next student, this should go through like three or four students before, I mean, maybe more. So once you've learned this, you're like, okay, I get it. Uh, pass it on to somebody. You don't, it's not hard, it's just weird. And when they first start out, maybe they don't know how to count carbs. And you're saying, how do they just begin? Handing them this little booklet and saying, guess what? It's not hard, it's just odd. Start by using this little book to say, eat anything in the book. And if it's in the good, great. Don't think you gotta get to best for like a year. I mean, really give yourself real time to transition. Um, volume isn't as, uh, isn't important, especially those first couple of weeks. We want them feeling satisfied. We want them feeling full. When they reach for satiety, uh, instead of reaching for, uh, meaning they reach for that sense of listen to your body, feel full. We want you satisfied with food. Um, and then we work them towards saying things like, you know, keto, on that keto continuum, we start to improve their choices over time. And without being overly uh, detailed in, um, how those answers come about. I mean, some people arrive saying, I did great, I'm ready for the next level. Um, I say, now we're gonna move you to the next step. Now we're gonna move you to the next step. And when I look at athletes, um, I really want them full, satiated, help, helping uh, the, the world around them um, be an easier place to navigate. We all can relate back to being in high school and saying, where is uh, where's the hardest part? And if you're about to change foods, uh, we don't want them adding any more irritability. We want them really feeling good about it. Uh, so let's give you a little update on how the kid is doing. So I didn't talk to his mom today, but I did uh, check in a couple of days ago. And uh, she said he's doing great. I think the, the food guide really helped him. He actually took, you get it with a one that's magnetized. So he took that and put it either in his locker or somewhere where he can see it. And then he had the food guide to look at. Um, but he, his mom said it was actually really helpful to know that you called and checked up on him and said, how is he? And I said, oh, I really want him to win this bet. <laughs> My sons are watching. So uh, if he loses, that's, that's going to be hard for me to convince my kids to do it. But the mom also said, um, the most interesting thing is, you know, she's got, I think, four boys. And she, she said, you know, he's at that age where he, you know, is really concerned about, um, or is really tired after school, he must be growing, or he, um, you know, he, he gets up in the morning and says, um, what are we gonna have for supper tonight? And she goes, I just noticed throughout the week that he stopped asking that question in the morning. He really gets up in the morning, I told him make bacon and eggs. I took over some of my favorite um, sausage patties that um, I think I fed my kids too much because <laughs> every time I bring them out, they're like, oh, not again, mom. So I said, here's some, you know, they really t do taste good. And so he has a really high fat meal every morning. And then I gave him the little hacks to say, here's what your school menu is for the week. Here's what I would eat. Here's the kind of things that are safe. And then take some pepperoni and cheese with you. If you get hungry, get full. We, want, we do not want you suffering. Uh, we don't want you hungry. And she said, you know, I've never seen him with this much energy. This was like Thursday night. Uh, so he'd been on the diet only like four days and leave it to teenagers to show you what a transition can really look like. And she said, it was amazing. He's got really good energy in the in the evenings and just seems to be in a great mood. <laughs> so there's nothing to sell a mom like saying, I didn't promise that and I, I don't promise your teenagers aren't gonna be irritable, but it is amazing how much more mental energy they have when ketones are available and they're young. They don't have 20 years of being overweight where their body doesn't remember how to use a ketone or doesn't know how to make one and in the end, you're like, okay, this transition is taking too long. This kid just needed less carbohydrates. You know, when we say, oh, that spam is processed food, I'm like, it's not nearly as processed as your cereal uh, and, or your most breads. 
And those processed foods really sink their brain down, their concentration is lower, that you can see their attention scan, uh, span bounces with their glucose, and, uh, and it makes it very difficult to succeed. The process of improving him uh, is week number one. So we'll keep you posted on how he's doing, uh, but uh, he took the uh, little bit of instruction. I mean, I think it took me less than you know, 15 or 20 minutes to, to sit down, ask him what he sees in that book that he liked, and just walk him through how important breakfast is, even if he hadn't been eating it before, and then some options for how to solve, well, what would you do in this situation? What do you like to drink? So I hope you use it. I hope once you're done using it, though, uh, you give it to somebody to say, here, follow this and pass it on to two or three students. I can remember in medical school, I would buy the used books. And as I would buy the books that were used, it was always helpful for me to see the writing they had put in the book. And I'd always pay a little more attention to where they'd written in it. So if you have one, maybe put your own little imprint on it that says favorite or um, tried it and maybe a date. And I just think it adds a little history to the book and who the next student could be. And I think that's fun. All right, let's go over to your comments, and while we do look at comments, I will, oopsie, wrong one, uh, I will check my sugars uh, and my glucose because I will see what our C8C10, it's only been an hour. You're sub supposed to be able to absorb it by like 20 minutes and hopefully make ketones by like 40 minutes, so we're right on the edge of that. And <clears throat> this is just water. All right, um, so let's take a closer look at some of your comments here. And if you have a comment, go ahead and put it in, uh, or questions. This is a great uh, opportunity where I try to answer them at the end of the show. And then even if you stay after, I try to peck away for a good 10 minutes to answer some more questions. Oh, I'm checking sugars. So yeah, putting the strips in. And all right. So we have Vincent who actually has checked in several times. His question reads, Dr. Boz, I've been following your suggestions of adding one MCT capsule daily until no diarrhea. Now that's a really big deal. Um, what many people, I go through this in the online course, that some of the things that really offend or really can't get past that first transition time of a ketogenic diet is if they can't absorb fat very well. Uh, a diseased or a inflamed or especially autoimmune issues with your gut. You can call it colitis if you've got a diagnostic book. You can call it leaky gut, which I don't like that word, but it's very commonly used. A leaky gut if you have, um, uh, sometimes have that. But one of the things that really is probably the most difficult is what Vincent talks about is, hey, every time I increase fat, I get diarrhea. And so we look at fat malabsorption for that. And fat malabsorption doesn't necessarily um, um, I mean, it, it can be correlated to a very low vitamin D, a very difficult brain. Um, here are, here is, so yeah, my glucose went up by about 10 points. So talk, that's what stress does. But my ketones hit two. And again, it's not usually, the, I usually get a little bigger bounce with my exogenous ketones. But the interesting thing about what he does while taking the MCT capsules is that's going to last for the next five hours. Like, I got a few things I need to do before tomorrow, <laughs> so this will be perfect, but I might not fall asleep as easily as I want to. So let's finish reading his question, though. He says, on uh, six per day, and I have some nausea. Uh, when do I stop adding or increasing the capsules of how many to, uh, to take? So I don't know if you saw how many I took there, but I took six of them, um, and that really is the a pretty good dose uh, of the amount of ketones that will get turned, or the amount of oil that will get turned into ketones. Um, what we want is um, that you absorb it. So, I mean, again, this is the kind of fat that you don't need to digest, you can't absorb it. So the first question I would have for Vincent is, when you, when people who follow the recommendation where, I've done this on, on the show before, I just have them start by biting into the soft gel. And so they just swallow some of that fat, uh, you know, it kind of coats on their mouth and, and so just a little bit gets in their gut. Once that's doing well, then they can swallow the first one, then they can have two a day, then three a day, and he's up to six and says, boy, I, I swallow it and I get some nausea. But the question I would have for you is, do you get any loose stools? Because in the people that are doing this slow step up of the, um, of the MCT oil, 
I don't, I'm trying to help them, their gut heal. And a ketogenic state will do that, but it's kind of like that chicken and egg. How do I get there when I can't take in a lot of these fats and they really get stuck? And I talk about this a, a great deal in that online course, using some of the, the fermented uh, foods, using some other tricks, but this MCT oil is like the most efficient fat for turning it into ketones. And of course it doesn't need to be digested. So it's really a great way to measure what, um, what impact you have. And with that ketogenic journey he's on, I would wanna know, does he have any loose stools? And then the second thing I would ask is um, the nausea can be a spike in your cholecystokinin. So cholecystokinin is another fat-based hormone. Uh, a lot of times patients don't know how or don't have a very good production of that at the beginning of their ketogenic journey. It is stimulated by the consumption of fat. So if they've been on a low-fat diet, and many Americans have, if they have high insulin, wow, they definitely um, can really find a, a uh, detriment um, um, just starting uh, in, in the ketogenic journey. If you look at the, the production of cholecystokinin, it gets better <laughs> when they're keto. So it's again, chicken and egg kind of thing, but once they're up to six capsules a day, and you say, boy doc, I get some nausea afterwards. Um, cholecystokinin is what makes you feel nauseated. So I'd want to know, is it about 20 minutes or maybe about 25 minutes after you take the capsules? And then how long does it last? Because if it is a spike in your cholecystokinin and you feel nause nauseous, which is another word for satiated, but it can be on an empty stomach, it feels more nauseating than satiating, um, then I would want to say, okay, you might want to have it with some uh, some other foods in the morning. Might wanna have it with a, a little kombucha, which is that fermentation. Again, helping to break it down a little bit. But then I'd look at your ketones and watch to see how well your ketones are produced for the next several hours. And if you've got a good ketone production uh, and you feel like you've got a, you're on a pretty good journey, then you can back off. Uh, again, uh, MCT oil is really meant to wake up those cells that uh, absorb fat, and you do this in a slight calculated way, increasing it one step at a time. By the time you get to um, six capsules a day, I mean, most people wouldn't advance that far if they were still having a, a really tough time with loose stools. So I would bet that you're getting the best value out of that oil and your ketones have been produced. The nausea is probably physiologic with a spike in cholecystokinin kind of saying, hey, mm, you've had enough, stop that. Uh, and I would hold off adding any more of it. Um, the longer you do the MCT oils, the less you need to, to take, I mean, they are something where, like most of the supplements, the only supplement that I ever, was it even with me? Um, oh, here it is. The only supplement that I would never have you stop doing is what, K2D3. The rest of the supplements are meant for a phase. They're meant for you to heal that body and then hopefully you don't need them. So if your body is doing well, um, we would say that you might not need those, those uh, C8, C10. You might be able to make it from Spam or Braunschweiger. Uh, the only vitamin that uh, is on the list for is the K2D3 and that, that's another story we'll tell a different day. But um, what does my husband take? My husband actually takes MCT oil capsules. He takes, I think, four or five in the morning. Um, and he's allergic to stevia, so he doesn't take any of the other things. Um, he does take the BHB capsules if he wants some um, exogenous ketones, because I put those in a capsule. And that's what he takes if he's saying, ah, I, I just, he's feeling tired or wants a little boost of energy. Um, but he's way more methodical than I am, so <laughs> he does it every day. Very good, good job. Um, all right, we are at the top of the hour and I will answer some of these other questions offline. I just wanna say thank you very much for staying to the end and we are signing off as Dr. Boz, improving your health one ketone at a time. Thanks everybody, we'll see you next week and I'll stay after to answer some of the questions.